Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We honor you and we receive your word this night. Thank you. It's being written in our heart and mind. Thank you. You're bringing revelation. Thank you that we will be doers of the word and conquer and overcome. Thank you for all that you bring forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We continue to share with you on the subject of conquering. We know in Revelation 21, 7, as we've seen consistently, he that overcomes, conquers, and carries off the victory, not just once in a while, but continually, because it's a present tense verb, meaning continuous action, shall inherit all things. That means you and I are to conquer and carry off the victory continually. And we're well able to do it because the Lord is on the inside of us. He's given us His Word. He shows us the way. He's given us all the weapons to conquer all of the enemies. We've been talking about many things, and we're now talking about conquering the enemy's tactics against you. And we looked at many things this morning. We'll just look at one scripture that we looked at before we move on. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, he is your adversary, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He cannot get to you, remember, unless conditions are met. When it says he may devour you, this is a subjunctive mood, which in the Greek means a conditional statement. Now, how does he work against you? Remember, we've talked about he can come at you because of a cause, which would be sin, but he will also come at you without cause, just because he wants to bring destruction against you. But he can't do it unless you allow him to, in a sense, because you've been given authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can conquer him. Meaning, if you don't conquer him, he can come forth and bring a devouring negative effect in your life. So what do we do? We resist him steadfast, strong, firm, immovable in the faith. This isn't the word normally for steadfast, hupomone. This is the word stereos, which means strong and firm and movable, immovable. Well, that's because you've gotten strong. You've gotten to the place where you are firm and nothing moves you because you do what the word says and you resist every attack of the enemy. And you're going to see him flee from you as you do what the word says. Remember that first of all, of course, we need to be submitted unto God. James chapter 4, verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. That means you're to arrange yourself and subordinate yourself, be in subjection to God. And we do that as we walk in line with His Word. Then, because you've done that, then you will be able to resist the devil steadfastly, successfully, and he will flee from you. Of course, as you've got to be in line with God's ways first, then you resist the devil and he will flee from you as you have authority and dominion. You can conquer every work of the enemy. Now, one of the scriptures we were looking at near the end of this morning, we'll look at it for a moment again. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will or might hear his voice, that is, because this again is subjunctive mood, if you might hear his voice, that means, how would we hear his voice? How does he speak to us? Remember, it says Jesus now is speaking. How is he speaking to us in these last days? Through Jesus. And that's he's the word. So it's coming through the word. And remember, when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, it's going to be bringing the word because he takes the things that he hears from above the word and shows them unto us. So if you will hear his word or what the Holy Spirit would be bringing to you from the word, then we must be ready to obey it. If you don't, you'll harden your hearts. So what would the devil's plan against you be? What would his tactic be? He wants you not to respond to the word. He wants you just to ignore it. Or he wants you just to, you know, maybe think about it uh, and just sweep it under the rug maybe or whatever. Pick and choose on certain things you want to do and other things you don't. Well, that's a mistake. When we hear his word, we are to take hold of it, put it in operation in our life. Don't harden your heart, as in the provocation of the day of temptation in the wilderness. The fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works 40 years. He was grieved with the generation because they always err in their heart because they weren't taking hold of it and hearing and doing the word. They've not known my ways. And that's an important point. If you err in your heart, 
Are you going to get revelation of his ways? No, you're going to end up walking in darkness. You're going to walk in the flesh. You're going to walk according to your own ways, and you will not get revelation. It's only those who do the word to get revelation, remember. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. And of course, the devil does not want you to enter into the rest which is possessing all the promises of God in your life. So you've got to be ready for his tactics. What you, what you do with the word is the key. And he goes on and says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, or really of one who is unfaithful, in departing from the living God. If a heart is faithful before God, it's going to receive the word and take hold of it and put it in operation and do it. That's what he's looking for. And notice it says you're departing from the living God. So, what, of course, what would the enemy like you to do? His tactic is to get you to depart from the living God, whether you realize it or not, which is actually what we're doing if we don't obey his word and do what he says. Exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. See, sin is very deceitful. It is doing a negative work in you. It's affecting you. It's hardening you. And where were they being hardened? In their heart. We must make sure that we're not giving place to any sin. For we are becoming, this is the word ginnomai, for we become partakers of Christ, which is what we're supposed to happen in our life, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, to see the end result accomplished. This is a form of the word for the word for perfection. It's going to bring us to that place. As we're doing his word, you're going to become like him. You're going to be a partaker of Christ. The work will be done in your life. Now, the enemy, of course, he wants to stop you from, con con uh, to, from being obedient to the Word and from doing the things that God wants you to do. One of the things you have to realize is the devil will he'll take whatever you'll give him initially. He just gets you to compromise a little bit. He'll, he'll take that to begin with. In Joel chapter 1, verse 4, we see how the enemy worked. The palmer worm, which the palmer hath left, hath the locust eaten, which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten, which the canker worm hath left, has the caterpillar eaten. This is the way the devil's design will be, and his tactics are to try to get to you any which way to start wearing you down. And this word here, the palmer worm, means a gnar. It is one who literally, when you look it up in the Hebrew, it means to wear away by persistent biting. Keep on working at you. Keep on hitting at you. This is why he keeps on peppering away at you with some negative thing coming at you. And if he can get you pulled down in some ways, then he won't stop there. He will step it up. And that's where the locust comes in to be. This is the swarmer. The locust swarmer. The one who comes and begins to swarm against you. He begins to heighten that attack coming against you. And this is the way he works. Well, that's why you've got to resist him right off the bat. If not, the, the enemies will they'll heighten it and increase the attacks coming against you, begin to swarm against you. And that which the locust has left, the canker worm has eaten. This is the devourer who comes in to devour you in some way and to start really bringing destruction. And this is the one who's devouring, striking repeated blows against you continually. The enemy... He wants to take you totally down. You've got to be ready to resist him. This is his designs. This is his tactics. Start out a little bit. And you wonder why you, you, your things were going okay and then they seem like they got worse. And how did I get over here? Look what's all happened. That's the enemy working little by little to get to you to bring destruction. And then at that canker worm, what's left, the caterpillar eats. He comes on the scene. He's the consumer, the ravager, who wants to do ruinous damage and devastate. That's what happens to people. Again, one of the keys will be especially watching your mind. Don't let the devil have place in your mind. and Make sure you're not compromising the Word of God. Be doing what he says consistently. If he can get you to back off, then he's going to start working this process little by little against you. Well, the good news is that God is at work to restore and to overturn all of the works of the enemy as you're doing what the Word says. Another thing that's important, understanding that the enemy will also try to get your eyes on circumstances. Whenever your eyes get on the circumstances or what the enemy's doing, 
Are you going to be focused on the Lord? No. And you're going to be affected adversely if you don't deal with it successfully. This we see in Matthew 14, verse 25. Here's when Jesus comes. He's walking on the sea, coming to them. Disciples saw him walk in the sea, got troubled, saying, as a spirit cried out for fear. Jesus said, Be of good cheer. It's I. Be not afraid. So, Lord, if it be thou, be thou, bid, bid me to come on the water. So he's now walking, comes down out of the ship, and he's walking on the water to go to Jesus, eyes on him. Now, is the enemy going to stand by and let this happen? No. His tactic is to disrupt this. And so when he saw the wind, strong and mighty, this means, who stirred up this wind? The devil did. He's going to come and try to get you off of looking at Jesus and walking in the ways of the supernatural, which would be walking on the water, would certainly be that way. He was afraid. <clears throat> that meant he responded to what the enemy was doing instead of resisting him. If you respond negatively to what the enemy is doing, he's going to take your eyes obviously are off of Jesus. You're not going to be in fear and faith at the same time. You're going to be in one or the other. And beginning to sink, which is what happens anytime you get your eyes off Jesus, he cried and said, Lord, save me. Of course, the Lord's there to do it. <clears throat> Immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand, caught him, and said to him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? This is the word distazo, meaning to stand in two ways, two stands. So that meant that he had his eyes on the Lord, but then he got moved by the attacks of the enemy. How you respond to the attacks of the enemy are important. And so his tactic is to get your attention and to get you to respond to what he's doing. If he can get you to respond to what he's doing, now you're going to, be, you're going to sink spiritually and the enemy is going to be working against you. And, of course, that's what happened in this case. And why was it? Jesus said he was of little faith and he was standing in two ways. We're going to be strong in faith if we stand in one way, on the Word, and we resist every attack that comes against us. <clears throat> the devil will also try to get you to turn against uh, and look at the, anything that is unseen, or anything that is seen instead of something that's unseen. We see this over in 2 Corinthians 4.18, while it says, We look not at the things that are seen, but we look at the things that are not seen. The things that are seen are temporal, they're all subject to change, but the things that are not seen are eternal, because now we're tapping into that which is in the Spirit, and when we look at the things that are not seen, we're looking at the Word of God, we got our eyes on Him, and we're going to take hold of the promises and speak what He says and put Him in operation. But if He can get you on, on the seen things, well, you're not looking at two places at once. You're either going to have your focus on the unseen, on the Word, or you're going to get focused on the scene. The enemy's tactic is to get you, do anything to get you off the Word. Get you on something else. Get you looking at the circumstances or at the scene manifested realm. And so if you do that, then of course he's going to be able to take you down and deceive you away from what God wants. We also cannot be moved by what, we, what the enemy is doing and when you see what the enemy is doing, you must keep your eyes on the Lord because you've got to know that he will give you the victory. We see this shown forth in Numbers chapter 13. Remember that God told them to go forth and they were to search the land. They searched the land after 40 days. and They were to go to see this land. And when they returned, they had showed forth the fruit of the land. Well, this is the land that God had set for us. And this is the land we're to go up and possess. They said, we came into the land where it sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey. This is the fruit of it. So they now testified that this is the land. Nevertheless, well now, we see another problem. The people be strong that dwell in the land. The cities are walled very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. When you're going to possess the promises, is the devil going to just stand by and not try to be hindering you or stopping you in some way? No, he's going to try to, to get you to divert your attention. He's going to try to, to make you think that he is stronger than you being able to go in and overcome him and possess the land. Yeah, they saw the children of Anak, the giants there. They saw these ites there all over the place. 
So that you can't be overwhelmed by the fact that there's a lot of devils to deal with and to cast out. You're just going to do it systematically. God's going to bring the victory. Little by little, you're going to overtake them. You're going to bring forth fruit and inherit the land. Well, he's, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it. We're well able to overcome it. That's what you have to do. You have to maintain the focus on the Lord, maintain the confession and declaration of what God says for you to do, and not be moved by what you see or what the enemy is, is looking like or showing up to be. doesn't matter. The men that went up, they said, though, no, we're not able to go up against the people. Well, they were now relying on their own strength. It says they're stronger than we. They said we brought, they brought up an evil report of the land. Well, wait a minute. The land was a land that was a good land, milk and honey and all this fruit. Now we change the tune? That shows you. You will get a different perspective on things if you get your eyes off of what God says and you start being influenced by the enemy. It'll start affecting you. And that's what happened to them. And so they, of course, spoke up this, called this land with land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. Well, that's not what they saw originally. And the people they saw in it were men of a great stature. They got deceived. Anytime you get your eyes off the word, you're now being deceived because you're getting looking at something else other than the word that's going to keep you focused on the truth. They saw the giants. They're moved by all the things they saw. Sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And of course, not only did it affect them in their attitudes towards being able to conquer, they even got a wrong image of themselves. We were on our own site as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. So what are you going to think of yourself? You're, not going, to, you're going to have a distorted view of yourself if you allow this tactic to work against you. And that is the fact that he's going to do everything possible to get you off of what God says and to think on what the enemy is doing and look at the enemy and think these big giants are going to be too much to overcome. Oh, you can't be moved by that. You've got to be ready to resist all of these attacks and keep your eyes on the Lord, looking at the unseen, eyes on the Word of God, which is the key. Another thing that the enemy will do, he will try to get you in compromise on things, to compromise the Word of God. We see over in Matthew chapter 16. This is where Peter had gotten revelation that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. It was revealed to him, remember, by the Holy Spirit. The Father had done it through the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus, after that, after he had told them about this, that there was going to, the church was going to be built on this revelation, the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it, he should have been tuned in to focus on the Lord getting revelation from God. But instead, of course, he said he gave him the keys of the kingdom, the rule and the reign of the heavens. And then he comes down to verse 21, and he began to show the disciples that he's going to go to Jerusalem, suffer many things, the elders and chief priests, scribes, and be killed, and raised again the third day. Was that something that they wanted to hear in the natural? No. What happened? Peter, the guy who was focused on hearing, getting revelation, now he's instead changing the tune. He didn't like what he heard, so now he's going to decide from his own standpoint, what he's going to do. He took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not come unto thee. That's just responding from man's attitude. We cannot respond from a carnal attitude on things. We must believe what the Word says and not respond in a negative way. He turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Notice, Peter wasn't the one he was speaking to. He's speaking to Satan operating through Peter. That tells you, anytime you get your eyes off of the Word and you start speaking or thinking things contrary to the Word, what happens? The devils come into you. The devil came into Peter. You think he's not going to come into you? He will. That's how evil spirits get into us when we get focused on uh, contrary to the Word of God. He said, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense to me. For thou savorest not... The things that be of God, but those that be of men. Now, this shows you the fact that here, this savorous is referring to valuing or minding the things of men over God. This is how people get into compromise. This is an important point. If you 
don't mind the things of God, but you start thinking about the things of men, you're going to respond to what men might think. You can get in compromise real easy. This is his tactic. His tactic is for you to respond to what men would think instead of what God would think. A respond to your mind on the things of men. Get your eyes off the things of God. That's a mistake. That is a tactic to cause you to compromise. And this is what happens when people get to be a man pleaser instead of a God pleaser. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, he talks about the exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. We were allowed to be put in trust with the gospel, even we speak, which is what you and I must do, not as pleasing men, but God, who tries our heart. God is trying our heart whenever we're speaking things, finding out whether we're going to speak things that are going to please God or whether we're going to speak things that are going to please men. If we please men, though that means now we're going to be in compromise, we're going to be thinking about what men think about something instead of about what God thinks. God wants us to take an uncompromised stand on doing what the Word says. This is a tactic that the enemy will bring, get you to consider what men will think. No, we need to consider what God will think. And actually, you realize God's actually trying your heart to find out, are you going to do what God says, or are you going to compromise for a person, for a, for a situation, and so in order to please men, so you don't maybe ruffle men, or you won't make them all upset, or whatever it might be. No, we've got to stand and do what the Word says and speak right, and we're not going to please men if it's going to be contrary to what God says. We're going to please God. We're not going to compromise whatsoever. Another thing that the enemy will try to, a tactic he'll try to work against you, again, is get you anxious. In this day and hour, as you see the things that are happening in the world, you've got to guard yourself from anxiety. Be careful. Be anxious for nothing. Regardless of what's going on, that all the negative reports of the evil men getting worse and worse and all the things that we see going on. Do not get anxious. Do not get worried. Do not allow anything to get you off of the Lord. What do you do? What's going to bring you through? The Lord's going to bring you through. How is He going to bring you through? Because you're going to pray and put them in operation. God's Word will come to pass. The angels will have charge of you to keep you and protect you in your ways. Be anxious for nothing. In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your demands, remember this word itema, the noun form of iteo, meaning demand of what's due you, made known unto God, because you're going to pray the promises. You're going to pray the word and take hold of them with thanksgiving, and you're going to put God in operation. And what's going to happen when you do that? The peace of God will be there. This tells you, if you don't have the peace of God, what happened? We must have got our eyes off of what he says, because when you pray the Word and you know what God will do, you take hold of the promises with thanksgiving, thanking Him because your faith's in operation. The peace of God that passes all understanding will guard. This is the word meaning guard. It will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. God wants you to be guarded, but you're not going to be guarded if you get anxious. When you're anxious, what happens? You just opened up the door to the enemy. Worry, anxiety, concern, care, whatever, you, you know, you can't water it down and say, well, I'm not worrying, anxious, I'm just a little bit concerned about this situation. Well, let's face it, you're frustrated and something's going on in you and you're unsettled within you. You just kind of watered it down a little bit. It's still the same thing. If you, what's going to be the barometer of whether I'm tuned in right, whether you have the peace of God? If you got the peace of God, now your eyes are on the Lord. You're going, you're, not going to, you're going to be fine. And it's going to guard your heart and mind because where's the attack? It's coming to try to get to your mind and get to your heart. So he can get you off of the Word of God and get the Word out of you as well. And of course, this is why your thinking on co things correctly is going to be a key. The tactic of the enemy, of course, is do anything to get your mind off of that which is of the Word. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true or are in line with the truth, speaking the truth, something that's in line with the truth, things that are honest, which means something that's honorable before God, things that are just, which are righteous, things that are pure, which are clean and be holy, 
things that are lovely, which would be acceptable and pleasing to him, things that are of a good report, things that are, if there be any virtue or moral excellence in it, if there be any praise, think on these things. And when it says think on these things, this is a command to you and me. Meaning, how are you going to stay in the peace of God? Because you're going to obey the command to keep your mind thinking correctly. You're not going to let the devil get to your mind. Of course, what's Satan's tactic going to be? His tactic is try to do anything to get your mind off the Word. It always comes down to the Word, doesn't it? Whether you're on the Word or not. Whether you're doing what the Word says or not. And if he can get to your mind and get you off of these things, you're going to be in anxiety. You're not going to be in faith. You're not going to be able to deal with things. You're not going to be, have a right perspective. You're not going to be able to hear from him and know what to do in the situation because we have gotten our mind off of the Word of God, which is a tremendous mistake. So what do you do? Not only do you pray and be anxious for nothing, but also you're actually to cast all these cares, anxieties upon the Lord. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care, your anxiety, upon him, for he careth for you. You cast them on the Lord. Don't you carry them. You're not going to carry these worries and anxieties. That's what the devil wants you to do. Remember, that will take away your peace. That will not guard your heart and mind. And your mind, you will not, you'll be troubled. You'll be in turmoil. You'll have all kinds of negatives going on in your mind. And of course, that's what the enemy wants to do. So we can take this word out of you and he can put negative things into you. So you've got to guard yourself. Now at the same time, know that pressure will come against you. We know this. The devil will use pressure. Remember what it says in Mark chapter 4. We talked about the parable of the sower in the past. That when the word's sown, Satan's coming to try to take it out. He'll do anything possible to get the word out of you. Well, we come to verse 16 verse 17, where it says, they had no root in themselves and so endured, but for a time. Afterwards, when affliction, this is pressure, or persecution, this is something that's going to try to put you to flight from the Word. It's arising for the Word's sake. Again, remember, what is Satan doing? He's attacking the Word in you. He's going to bring the pressure. What's the pressure designed to do? Get you off the Word, so he can take the Word out. Persecution gets you to flee from the Word. Immediately they're offended. They stumble. They sin. They make a mistake. And so the devil can get to you with affliction, pressure, tribulation, any kind of persecution that comes against you. All these things are all designed. These are his ways in order to, his tactics, to get the word out of you. you got to be ready to deal with everything. Now you have to understand, you will have pressure. You're in this world. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33. These things have I spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. If you're abiding in him, you're to have peace. In the world, which we are in, you shall have pressure. Tribulation is thlipsis, meaning pressure. There will be pressure. You're going to just resist that pressure and not give place to it. Be of good cheer, of a good courage. I have conquered the world. Therefore, you can conquer the world as well. So you don't give place to it. And you will have pressure. But look what it says in Acts 14, 22. It speaks here when he's went about confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. And then he points out an important thing, that we must, it is necessary, through much tribulation to enter into the kingdom of God. The enemy will come against you, and you're going to enter into the rule and the reign of God as you're ruling and reigning and conquering the enemy. Well, he's going to press you. He's going to try to hinder you, but you're going to go through that pressure to enter into the kingdom to rule and reign over the enemy, meaning the pressure is not going to take you down. You're going to dispel that pressure. You're going to conquer it, overcome it as you go forth and enter into the kingdom, which is the rule and the reign of God in your life. And you must know that whatever attacks come against you, God will deliver you out of them. 2 Timothy 3.11, this speaks about what happened with Paul as he was going in, out from place to place. He said, persecutions, afflictions, 
which came in me at Antioch, at Conium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. He had attacks. Out of them all, the Lord delivered me. God will deliver us. And then he makes another statement, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. This tries to make you to flee, to put you to flight. It will come against you. You're going to stand. You're going to do what's right. You're not going to compromise. He didn't compromise. He got delivered out of it. We're going to live godly, and that is so important. So the devil's attacks will come with the affliction, with the pressure, with the tribulation, with cares, worries, anxiety, anything that gets you off of doing the Word of God. This is his attitudes against you. Another thing we see over in 1 Timothy, and we did look at this at the end of the last time, his strategy or his uh, tactics against you is will get you off of the true doctrine. It says, In the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Deceiving spirits, they'll try to get you off the word. Doctrines of devils get you to believe something that's contrary to the word. If we have false doctrine, then we're not having God, remember. Those who are not abiding in the doctrine, they're not having doctrine. They're not having God whatsoever. We must deal with the doctrines and make sure that our doctrines are in line with the Word of God. Remember, Satan has gone forth to deceive, and he's trying to deceive every single person. He's done quite a job in the body of Christ with all the doctrinal error that's there. Deceiving people away from the truth. Again, this is his tactic. There's doctrines of devils. There's traditions of men. There's commandments of men. Remember what it says over in Mark chapter 7, where he speaks about in verse 9, he said to him, Full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. We do see that people like to keep their traditions. They're slow to get rid of things. They're slow to come to the place of repentance, which is a mistake. We should be ready to repent on the spot. We come to verse 13, and he said, Making the word of God of none effect through your traditions. It shuts down God's word working in your life. So we cannot allow traditions of men, commandments of men, anything that's contrary to the word of God that's trying to turn us away from the truth. And they had to deal with that. You're going to have to do the same thing. You're going to have to conquer and overcome. It says here about how the principles of the world will also come against you. And these are all after the commandments and doctrines of men. We cannot follow doctrines and commandments of men. We must follow the things of the Word of God. Otherwise, they're going to be deceiving you. This is why you've got to know the Word so you don't get into error. Remember, they had to, they had to try all those ones. 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe every not, not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they're of God, because there's many false prophets that have gone out into the world. Those ones that are acting like they're speaking truth, but they're not, if it's speaking contrary to the Word. You speak, see, it comes down to verse, uh, uh, back in verse uh, 6 it is, sorry. Verse 6, he says, We're of God, he that knoweth God heareth us, he that's not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth, people are going to hear us as long as we're speaking the word, and the spirit of error, deception, that's leading people astray. That's why, the spirit of error, that's why, how am I going to know what to listen to? Or why am I going to know what's right? You're always going to check things out in line with the word. It is critical. And someone who will compromise the word they're making a great mistake. You cannot do that. You're going to give place to the enemy in your life. And this is another way of his tactics to get you off track. Remember the ones who were the Bereans, Acts 17, 11? They were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all readiness of mind. And they searched the scriptures daily. So we should receive the word with readiness of mind. But we need to also make sure we're searching the scripture daily whether those things were so. So we just don't believe whatever comes to us. We don't want to be gullible to receive whatever so-and-so said, especially if they come and try to tell you some revelation and uh, you, you don't know if it's in line with the Word or not. You search the Scriptures. It's important that we're not going to be tossed to and fro through all these 
false teachings and false doctrines that are contrary to the Word of God. God wants you to get stable and established in the Word. Another thing we must realize is that Satan will do anything possible to hinder the things that God wants for you to do. So his strategy is, how can he hinder you? What can he do to hinder you? Can he use a person? Can he use a situation? Can he orchestrate some circumstances? Whatever he can do, he will try. And he was successful in hindering Paul. He said, we would have come unto you, I have been Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. That means if you're being hindered from accomplishing the things that God has for you, well, you know it's the devil working in some way. You need to discern what's going on and conquer that situation. Speak to that mountain to be removed. Not get, resist that which is coming against you. Make sure you're not letting him get to you. Remember, he, got, he was hindered, but he grew up. This is the earlier letters in Thessalonica. They grew up and he got to the place where he was not being hindered. <laughs> and he was overcoming the works of the enemy. At the same time, what other tactics will the enemy have? He knows that God's leading you and he's doing great things in your life and just blessing you and, and bringing these promises. So what's he going to do? He's not going to stand by and just do nothing. Even when God opens up a good door to something, a great door and effectual is open to me. Aha, God's done. look what God's done. Well, does that mean it's smooth sailing from then on necessarily? No. There are many adversaries. The adversaries will try to come. Remember, this is why we got to ongoingly always be watchful because you ought to understand the enemy's tactics. You're going to be watchful. You're going to be vigilant. You're going to be ready, watching and praying so you don't enter into any temptations many adversaries, he had to deal with them. You're going to have to deal with adversaries that will try to be raised up against you. You're just going to go right through and you're going to do what comes. You're in line with the Word. You're going to overcome them. Notice what it says here in Philippians 1.28. In nothing terrified by your adversaries. Don't get in fear because of the attacks of the enemy. Don't let that happen. Nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. These ones that try to do evil things or lead you astray, these are adversaries. Don't be fearful. Don't be moved by the attacks that are coming against you. It's so important that you be steadfast. Know that God will deliver you out of them, remember, and He will bring you forth as you walk in His ways. You can overcome the adversaries that will be arrayed against you. Now, another thing that's important, the enemy will try to stop your faith. Remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. And the faith we have is the faith of Jesus that we operate in, that puts the power of God in operation, that will overcome the world, that will bring all the promises, that will move every mountain, that will bring forth, cast out every devil, bring forth victory. Here we see in 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, he says, For this cause when I could no longer forbear, forbear, because we see in here, he said, I can no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by any means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. Otherwise, did the enemy get to you and take you down and you're not now operating in faith anymore? Uh, we see that there's people who have done that where they're operating in faith, and, but then all of a sudden they turned away and they went back into a different direction. They went back doing things according to their own ability or in the natural or turned away. And then he says, and our labor would be in vain. That means your faith is a key. Where is your faith at? Your faith should be getting strong. It should be growing. Your faith should be put in operation. Your faith should be applied to deal with every situation. You always need to be in faith, which means you're going to be in line with the Word, remember. And you're going to be speaking the Word, believing the Word, working your faith with power to see God accomplish the things that He purposes. So the enemy is going to try to get to your faith. He'll do anything possible to try to stop your faith from working. Another thing, of course, is he will try to get you off the truth. And here is a situation in 2 Timothy chapter 2. In verse 24, here is where it's speaking of one who has been taken captive by the devil. 
Well, if someone's been taken captive by the devil, what do they need? They need the word to come to them, the truth, and then they need to receive that word and do what's necessary to, of course, come to repentance, changing their mind, believe the truth, but they're going to have to do what's necessary to overcome what's happened from the devil coming into them. And this would be true for us or for anybody we might come in contact with. When you come in contact with people, the servant of the Lord must not strive. Don't ever get into strife, because remember, the, the gospel is confrontational. It will be confrontational with the truth. The word of God is going to be confrontational when you come to people, you know, that have not received what is the truth. You're going to be gentle unto all men. You're going to be apt to teach and patient, forbearing them, not condemning them or coming down on them hard whatsoever. In meekness, with a mildness, with a gentleness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Notice, they're opposing themselves because they're contrary to the Word. So they need instruction. They need instruction from you. And what do you give them? The Word. If God, peradventure, per perhaps, will give them repentance, changing their mind to what? This precise, correct knowledge, which is a noun. This is not a participle. This is a noun. This is the word. It is a noun, referring to the precise, correct knowledge, as we see. The precise, correct knowledge of the truth. So that means they've got to receive the truth and come in line with it. They can't be believing the things that they've believed if they've been off the truth or believing some half-truths half and some half-lie. That they and they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Now this tells you another thing. When you're ministering to people, you can't get them out of the snare of the devil. They have to get themselves out of the snare of the devil. Your job is to give them the truth that'll help them to change their mind and come to the precise, correct knowledge of the truth so that they can come to repentance, changing uh, and turning away from what they've either been believing or doing. And they get to recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. You can point them in that right direction. You can be a help to them, but they have to do it. They have to respond to the word. You can never make anybody respond to the word. And you're not going to be able to get them out of it. They're going to have to act on the word and do it themselves. That is important to realize. Of course, I've seen people with a rescue spirit come and think that they're going to help everybody get free of all these problems. Well, you have to realize you're coming to give them the word to help them, but you're not going to rescue them. They have to recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. So don't be led astray by the tactic to think that you're going to come and save them or get them out of this. Well, you're going to bring them the truth so that they can take hold of and act upon it themselves. I've seen this so much in the areas of deliverance. People come and they want you to get them delivered out of a problem. But, you know, well, have they dealt with a sin? Have they got the word in them? Have they come to turn away from that area? Do they understand that it's going to be an ongoing process of casting out? Do they understand they're going to have to resist the enemy and retain their deliverance and do these things? That's important. That's why you've got to get the true teaching to them and make sure then, see, of course, the devil just wants people just to come and not realize what they need to do. Just, oh, just get me free of this problem, you know. They're not going to get free of the problem, not unless they correct it and come in line with the word. And so the tactic will be just, oh, I'm I'm coming to the rescue, and I'm going to, you know, cast this out, and it's all going to be gone, and everything's going to be great. That's what's mostly happened. Many people just go, and they want somebody to, you know, they call every prayer line in the world, you know, get for their healing or whatever. It's fine to let people pray for you, but you better be praying for yourself and make sure you got things in order. So the tactic is oftentimes is just try to, if you, for the person, just to try to get somebody else to get me out of this, when you have the faith in your God, God's your source, you're going to do what the Word says to recover yourself out of the snare of the devil. And also, when you go to minister to people, don't think that you're going to be able to get them out. Instead, you're going to bring them to the place where they'll know what to do. You can be a help to them, but they have to do it. So the tactic of the enemy is to get you off any way you can, any, any, and off of what needs to be done. And even, this is where many people have rescue spirits. They get a rescue spirit, they think I'm coming to rescue, and I'm going to be their source. 
mistake. Never try to do that. You're coming to give them the word to help them come to repentance so that they can then recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. That is important. Another thing that we must realize is that the enemy will try to work at people, try to work at you any way possible, for whatever reason, in order to turn back to anything outside of the Word of God. This is where Demas was going along here, involved in the ministry, but he forsook him. And he having loved this present age, and he, so he went back. What a mistake. Is this it's why you got to have the knowledge? Is there anything good in this age? No. The devil has gotten this, this whole age is contaminated in the world because of the effects of sin and everything. He's the ruler of this world system. He's the God over this age. And so there's nothing that shows a person has not realized what has happened in this world. This guy, he loved, he was wanting to go back to the present age. What a mistake. He forsook him. That, we can't have that. You've got to make sure that you don't let the devil cause you to go back into anything of this age. And also, you've got to make sure that you're going to stay faithful to do the things that God wants you to do. Don't let yourself ever turn back from the things that God has for you. It doesn't matter what, what situation is coming up, you want to do what God says. This is a case where we see the compromise that came to Barnabas. Barnabas was already one who'd been easily compromised by the hypocrisy of Peter, remember, when he came uh, there and Paul had to come on the scene and, and rebuke him publicly because he was being hypocritical with the brethren that came from Judea who wouldn't eat with the Gentiles, remember? Acts chapter 15, this is when Paul said to Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they do. Barnabas determined to take with him John, whose name, surname was Mark. Well, was he a candidate to go anywhere? No, because what had happened? Paul thought good not to take, take him with him, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. He wasn't faithful. He wasn't one who you could trust. He one who, you know, started out and then quit and, and left and went back. Same thing, just like this other guy who departed, wanted to go back for whatever reason it might have been. In this case, of course, they had quite a contention. The contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. Well, why is that? Because Paul wasn't going to compromise the word. But Barnabas was a compromiser. We already saw that, his problem that he had in the past. He apparently didn't overcome this, these things. And so he wanted to take Mark. Now, some people think that that's a, well, they're merciful towards that person. Well, mercy is great. But when it comes to the place of compromising whether someone's going to be faithful and one that you're going to have involved in the work, no, he's got to prove himself. This guy hadn't proved himself. It was the opposite. So sometimes people can have a, a mercy motive and they're just going to be merciful and they kind of overlook whatever they've done. Oh, no, that's a mistake. You've got to look at their track record. You've got to find out whether or not they are one who has come to the place where they're being faithful. In this case, Paul did right. Barnabas was wrong. And so they did separate. And we pointed out before that Paul, of course, chose Silas and departed. And what do we see throughout the rest of the time? We never see anything about Barnabas because he made a mistake. He made the compromise. You cannot compromise. Satan's a tactic will be what? To get you to be in compromise. Even from a, a show a mercy motive, you're going to forgive that person, but you've got to look at their track record. You've got to look at where the fruit is in their life. You know, you don't promote someone that's not going to be faithful. And he was promoting him even when he wasn't faithful. So that was contrary to the word. That's a mistake. That's, you can't let yourself do that. Many people have, you know, they have a mercy motive. They're real merciful. and they're, It's not being hard. It's being right according to the word, doing what's right. Of course, you give them, if they come to the place of proving themselves and getting right again, great. But until they've done that, they're not a candidate to go. This guy was not a candidate 
because he just wanted to take him again when after he had left. So, of course, Barnabas, we never hear from him again. What a mistake. Compromise, the, what's the tactic of the enemy? Get you to compromise. Get you to do things. It may seem like a right thing, being merciful and so forth, but if it's contrary to the word, it's a mistake. He'll try to use situations to get you to make wrong choices. You've got to guard yourself. You've got to take a stand for things that are right. Again, that's not saying that we don't take someone who's come to the place of being restored because they've shown forth the change and the fruit in their life. That's we want to, of course. God wants to. But until that's so, they're not a candidate. No way. That is important to realize so you don't make any mistakes. Another thing that we see is the fact that the enemy will try to get you to respond to anything that is of the flesh. Remember that he will use the flesh to try to stop you. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Walk in spirit, and you might not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Remember, what's dwelling in the flesh? Sin. So, if sin's dwelling in the flesh, can I ever yield to the flesh, the human nature desires? See, human nature will try to kick in and make, for you to make decisions, and the devil would like you to respond according to the human nature way in a situation. That's a mistake. There's always going to be a conflict between the spirit, which is always going to do the word, and the flesh, which is speaking of the human nature. The man's desire, what he wants, the desires that come from the human nature attitude. Remember that the flesh is lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. They are contrary, they are opposite and adverse one to the other. So there will be a war or a fight to try to get you not to do what's right in spirit and try to get you to respond out of the flesh or from a human nature standpoint. This is a mistake that many people make. You cannot allow this. The devil will work, try to work through the human nature to get you to maybe yield to something that you shouldn't yield to. It's a mistake. You always got to think, what does the Word say in every situation? In fact, we don't want to even give place to anything of the human nature desires for even a second. No. We even see that when it talks about over in Romans chapter 13. Verse 14, put ye on, clothe yourself with, same word for, clothe, for putting on the armor of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Make not provision. What's the word provision mean? It means forethought. Don't have any forethought for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof, to think about the way human nature would think about dealing with the situation. If you deal with things according to the way you feel, according to your soul, according to human nature attitude, you can make mistakes. Well, I'm passionate, but if it's contrary to the Word, don't, don't, that's a mistake. You have to do what is right in line with the Word. No thought for the flesh, ever, to yield to that and allow it to work against you. Another thing the enemy will do is, as we see over in Mark chapter 5, he will try to bring fear and he'll speak a negative against you when a circumstance has changed. This is the case when Jesus is on the way to minister healing to the daughter who's at the point of death could die any moment. So it wasn't a surprise that she died. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, certain said the daughter's dead. Well, that reports it. But then the next thing is the key. The tactic of the enemy is he'll jump on top of that circumstance and sow something else of then trying to get you to stop following the Lord, in this case, to see his daughter be restored and healed or come, or come out of that. Why troublest thou the master any further? That's the give up thought, the give up point. Don't let anything throw the give up point at you. We're not going to we're not going to give place to that. And what is that doing? It's actually causing you to be afraid that the promise won't come to pass. And Jesus, as soon as he heard what was spoken, he said, Be not afraid. Fear would rip you. Only believe. 
If you continue to believe, you'll stay in faith. If you don't, why? why? You got afraid that, it won't, that you won't see your daughter be raised up and restored, even though she was at the point of death. It wasn't any surprise that she died. That wasn't the end. Jesus was one who raised people from the dead. And so here, he continued, of course. He did the right thing. He passed the test. And he didn't let that tactic take him down whatsoever. Another thing is, you have to watch that you don't be reasoning things in your heart or in your mind. We see this with people. Instead of just believing the word and acting on it and agreeing and accepting it, they start reasoning in their minds. Look what happened here. This is where Jesus speaks and said son, son, uh, to the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins have been forgiven you, been remitted, sent away from you. Well, the scribes, instead of just asking him if they didn't understand, well, why did you do that? I didn't know you could do that. How could you do that? Explain this to me. No, they started reasoning in their hearts, and they determined he was speaking blasphemies. Instead of being open and teachable and wanting to inquire and find out an answer, they just made a judgment right away. The devil will try to get you to be making a judgment about something instead of being open and teachable and correctable and examining the situation and finding out. If you know what the Word says and you know it's wrong, then you know it's wrong. But if you don't, these guys, they of course didn't have things straight at all. They, they accused him of speaking blasphemies. Who can be sending away sins but God only? That was, their, they had, that was their belief. Well, that was a mistake. And Jesus said, why reason you these things in your hearts? That means you have to watch what's coming on, what's reasoning in your mind or in your heart about things maybe that you don't understand if you haven't gotten the understanding from the Word of God yet. And of course, he proceeded to tell them they should have asked him first, but you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to be sending away sins. But they didn't inquire that. Otherwise, make sure you don't make any judgments until you get the truth. Examine the Scriptures and see what the Word says. And if the Word says such and such, then you hold fast to it, of course. At the same time, you don't let yourself reason in your mind. This is what happens a lot of times. People start reasoning in their mind and they shut themselves out from coming to truth or coming to repentance or coming to any revelation. These guys shut themselves out from that because they made their conclusion themselves based on what they were reasoning in because of their belief. That's why you always have to be ready to hear the truth, examine it. Again, we don't just receive whatever someone says without checking it out. But if now you got to got to make sure that you check this out and you are receptive to anything that would come. But at the same time, don't be responding immediately, reason in your heart because you be you could be making a mistake. You could if you had something that's false, you could be thinking contrary to what the truth is, and then take an attitude against what's being said. Again, what's our responsibility? Search the scriptures to see if it's so. Make sure it's in line with the word. If it's not then speak against it. Come and approach the person. Ask the question or, you know, if it's something you know it's false, you challenge them. You bring the truth to them. You share it with them, you know. So give, and then you have a, 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 a dialogue such with them, if they will, and you bring the scripture. That brings everybody a chance to come to truth because what's God want? He wants people to come to truth. Now, if they won't be receptive, even you talking to them, well, you know they're not even open to truth. They're just trying to push their belief or push their, their attitude or whatever it is that they want to do. Well, then you know there's a problem. But you did your part. You did the right thing. See, Satan's attack tact, tactic is just to get you to respond out of where your own mindset is without having checked it out in the Word or thinking about it or finding out whether what you're believing is true or not. Don't fall for that. You always got to be thinking, what does the Word say? That is the key. Another thing that the enemy will do, he tries to keep you away from knowing the truth, so, and you'll, you'll end up following false, false teachings. His tactic, of course, 
and he's, been, he's done this successfully in the body of Christ to keep people away from looking at the tense voice and mood to find out what's really saying, said. So they just believe whatever, especially when you have the translations that are wrong. Here's a good example. Mark 11, 23. Whosoever shall say to the mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, so I do that. Shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he say, saith shall come to pass. He'll have whatsoever he saith. Has anybody checked out the, the tense voice and mood here to see what it really is saying? No, they just say, speak one time and that's it. So if you've heard the speak one time, command one time teaching of the word of faith, which has been prevalent throughout the world for many years, then you're going to think that I spoke it once, it shall come to pass, that's it, it's going to happen. Well, what would, what would the devil's tactic be? He doesn't want you to examine things. He doesn't want you to do your due diligence to study. Remember, we've got to rightly divide the word of truth. How can you rightly divide the word of truth? You've got to examine it. You've got to check it out, and you've got to find out if this is correct or not. First of all, is the translation right? Well, first of all, we look at the word, the things which he saith, and we find out this is present tense. Well, what does that mean? That means the things that I'm saying continually. Well, they told me I'm only supposed to speak one time. Well, that contradicts it right there. <laughs> oh, I'm supposed to be saying continually to the mountain to be removed. That's what that shows you. So, what's Satan's tactic going to be? Make sure that you don't study the Word. Make sure that you don't examine things and do your due diligence to find out exactly what's being said. This has happened. This has been his ma a major tactic, and that's why we have so much false things out there people haven't seen. They don't know about the present tense. They don't look and see the subjunctive mood. They don't see when it's a middle voice. They don't see when it's a perfect tense. They don't see these things when maybe it's a plural instead of a sing singular, like heaven. It's heavens, you know, and all those scriptures about the kingdom of heavens. They think it's talking about heaven when it's not because they haven't done their due diligence. Satan's a tactic, tactic of his will, to get you just to think that you are right, but you aren't because you didn't do your due diligence. We have to do our due diligence. We have to become experts in knowledge. We've got to become experts and studying and finding out exactly what's so. And then, of course, after that, what you're saying, you also have to understand how faith works. It's not just speak one time and then just it's going to happen all, all automatically happen. No, you're going to be continually speaking, but also, does that mean that I'm, it's going to come to pass then? Well, it all also depends on what you're believing is happening every time you're speaking. When you speak, what do you believe? Well, I believe it shall come to pass at some point in time. That's a mistake. How do we know that? Because you can't just look up one word and say, oh, okay, I see I'm supposed to speak continually. Well, you also have to check this out. Shall come to pass means it's a future thing. It's going to happen at some point in time. Is that what it's saying? No. How do you know? Because you looked up the tense voice and mood. Is it a future tense vo vo verb? No. It's a present tense. So how would you translate it? Believe those things which you say and are continuous saying are coming to pass. That's critical. Will you see your mountain moved if you don't believe that every time you speak it is coming to pass? It's working and working, working, working all the time? No. This is why one of the major things, the tactics the devil has done is keep people away from studying the Word and learning it. He didn't even want people to hear words, the Word. That's why he wants them to tell jokes. He wants them to tell sermons that are just stories and tell them this, to give a talk and just kind of ramble on or maybe give their opinions and these kind of things. This has been a major tactic to deceive the body of Christ whole <laughs> throughout the world. They don't have things straight if they haven't studied. This is a prime example. Major deal. You say continually to the mountain and you must understand every time you say it is coming to pass. It's happening. If not, are you going to see this be performed? No. This means due diligence on our part is we've got to become experts in studying the Word and learning it. So, of course, Satan's tactic is 
He wants to keep you ignorant. He wants to keep you off track in some way. Remember, that's what he, just think what happened with Eve. Eve didn't understand where the tree of life was. <laughs> she didn't get things straight. What we, the tree was in the midst of the garden. She didn't get that straight. She thought it was the other thing was. And she also didn't understand that you couldn't touch it. He just said you couldn't eat it. So if you don't have the precise word, you are going to be a candidate to be easily deceived. What does that mean? You and I have to really become studious. There is no other way. You can't just go along and just think that I'm just going to be, well, you know, I'll be okay. If you're not studious and learning exactly the truth, you're not going to be right. You're going to get led astray. I've seen this because whatever you start hearing, it's going to affect you. I've seen people that were here, even here, that were at one point, that were hearing the word and then went off in another direction and were hearing some other things from some other people and then they started believing things that were contrary to the word and they got confused about stuff. Well, you've got to take heed of what you're hearing and you've got to be sure you're checking everything out and you can get led astray. That is so important. So what's the answer? The answer is you're going to become studious. You're going to make sure you don't fall for Satan's tactic that you don't know what you're talking about or you're talking about something that's not right or something, you know, and someone comes along and say, you're saying such and such and then they can prove to you, no, that's not what it says. <laughs> you're going to have egg on your face, so to speak, because, you know, oh, I thought I had it straight and you didn't have it straight because we didn't do our due diligence. Don't resist any thoughts of you not becoming expert in knowledge and becoming someone who studies. Don't think that you can't learn all these things. You can, and you are. You are to learn, you are to become a one as an expert in knowledge and to get all these things established in you. That is so important. Another thing that we must do is we cannot have any priorities out of line. What will the devil do? One of the things, another thing, major things he does, he wants to get your priorities out of line. He wants you to get things more important than the things of God. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. It came to pass as they went in the way, a certain man said unto them, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Oh, that sounds like a good statement. Well, Jesus said, okay, you are. Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man is not where to lay his head. You're going to follow me? Uh, no guarantee of whether you're going to have a place to lay your head or not. <laughs> well, he comes along here and, and he says, and he said to another, follow me. And he said, Lord, suffer me first, priority, to go and bury my father. Didn't say the father was dead. It means he'd want to carry, be with him and, until the time when he would die. Doesn't mean he was dead then. Mine it can be just that he's going to, I'm going to take care of my father until he's died. Otherwise, I'm not going to follow you until after my father has lived his life and he's passed away and I bury him. Huh. What's that mean? He put the Father ahead of the Lord. Can you put a person ahead of the Lord? No. Well, that's Satan's tactic. tactic would lie, his tactic would lie, be with, to put something or some person ahead of the Lord so you don't do what God wants you to do. Big mistake. Priorities out of line. Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead and go thou and preach the gospel of the kingdom. You should be on board to do the things that God wants you to do. Another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell that are at my home, at my house. He said, you know, you need to go back to your house and even talk to them. You're going to do the, what the Word of God says, period, all the time. Again, priorities, let them go first, first in time. What does all this mean? It means there were other priorities ahead of what God's priorities are. Anytime your priorities are out of line, the devil's tactic has been successful against you. That means we can't let anything, we can't let work hinder us. We can't let desires of what I want to do hinder us. We can't let a person hinder us. We can't let anything. Not that we're ignore, ignoring our responsibilities that we carry out, like in work or people or whatever. We just don't let anything take our priority over following the Lord and doing the things that he wants us to do. Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Meaning, we have to have our priorities in line. 
Here we see in what goes along with that is also the excuses. We see this over in Luke chapter 14, verse 16. A certain man made a supper. This is the same word for the supper in Revelation 19, where it talks about the supper, the great the supper of the Lamb, marriage supper of the Lamb. He bade many, because that supper, what suppers are we going to be coming to? The supper of the Lamb, right? The marriage supper of the Lamb. He called many. Bade means he called many. And that would be the multitudes. He sent his servant at supper time to say to them that are bidden, Come, and all things are now ready. They all with one consent began to make excuse. They gave excuse why they couldn't come. The first said to him, I bought a piece of ground. I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. Will there be any excuse for not following the word of God and doing what he says? No. We, can, we put the word of God first place in everything we do as we are following him. We're going to still, it's not means we're ignoring our responsibilities of the things we need to do. No, we're going to do them. But in this case, he said, he said that I bought a piece of ground. Excuse me from doing what you want me to do. We cannot have an excuse. You're living unto him. You're bought with a price. You're a purchased possession. You're not your own. You belong to him. You're going to obey him and follow him and do what he wants for you in, in your life. Another said, I bought five yokes of oxen. I go to prove them. Pray that I have excused. Again, that's the guy saying, I got, I got this job or this situation, and this is going to be my priority. Excuse me. <laughs> He's, no. You are not called to have excuses. You're called to follow him and to do what he says. Anything that causes you not to, and you think that's going to be an excuse, it's not going to work. He said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Getting married, is that any reason why you can't follow the Lord? No, you're going to follow the Lord regardless. Hopefully, the person you married will be in line with the Word. If they haven't, you're going to still follow the Lord regardless. You're going to obey. You're going to do what God says. That's it. You're not going to let anything compromise. You're going to encourage that person to, of course, get in line with the Word of God, but you're going to follow the Lord 100%. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things, and the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly in the streets and lanes of the city, bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. The servant said, Lord, it's done as thou hast commanded, and yet there's room. And he said, Go in the highways, hedges, compel them to come in that my house may be filled. He said, that, and then he makes the statement, none of those men which were called, bidden, shall taste of my supper. That means anybody who makes an excuse to not follow the way of the Lord, they're not going to make it. They're not going to make it. You can never say, well, I made an excuse because of my wife or my husband or my son or my daughter or my job or this situation or this circumstance that occurred or whatever it might be. No. It's going to cost you. We're not going to make any excuses. We are going to follow the Lord and do everything that he says. Now, also, it's possible that you could be on track at one point, and now you're not on track anymore. This is actually the case with Judas. Look here about Judas. Judas, it says here, when he's speaking of all the Disciples, here's all the disciples in Matthew 10, 3 listed. And it speaks about Judas Iscariot, who also, he did betray him. But look first of all, what did all these disciples start out with? These 12 Jesus sent forth, that includes Judas, commanded them saying, go not in the way of the Gentiles. They were supposed to go forth. And what were they to do? Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Go and preach the kingdom of heavens at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you receive, freely give. All 12 of them went forth. He was going forth and doing the things of God. At the beginning, well, what does it say further? Was he a bad guy from the very beginning? No, look at the scripture. This is important to realize. This shows you where the translation causes a problem. Here it's speaking about Judas, the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot. The King James says, who also was the traitor, makes you think that, well, he must have been a traitor from the very beginning. Not so. 
the word was is not was. It's the word ginomai. And we've pointed this out many times. He became the traitor. He wasn't the traitor initially. Aorist tense, past tense. He became the traitor. Otherwise, he was going forth, but something happened, and he became the traitor. What happened to him? He got off track. What do we see that was, the tr was about him? John chapter 12 tells us about this guy. In verse 3, Mary, they took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Aha, this is the guy that got off track. Simon's son, which should betray him. Now when it says should betray him, does that mean he was destined to do that? Now well, let's look at this for a moment. This is the word present tense, first of all, and it is the word, when we look this up, this particular word here, it's the word mellow, which means be intending or going about to betray him. That's important. It's not like he was destined to betray him. He was being about or intending or having in mind to betray him because he was already in sin and the devil had already got to him and caused him to be in the state he was in. Look what happens next. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? He was mad about it. He didn't like the fact that this was a very costly thing. It was costly. He said not that he cared for the poor because he was a thief and he had the bag and bear that was put there. He was a stealer, he was a thief. He was stealing the money out of the bag. Well, this is a guy that was on par at first. It said he was going to become, he became a traitor. And what happened? He's now stealing the money. What's going to happen when you steal the money? Aha, the devil, he's going to be able to get to you. And what is the devil trying to do from the very beginning with Jesus? Remember the time he was born, he was trying to kill him? <laughs> he's going to kill him, want to kill him somehow. Tried to, you know, Herod raised him up, go out and kill him all two years and younger. Try to kill him. You know, when he comes in, the devil tries to get him up on the pinnacle of the temple. And, Just cast yourself down, you know. Well, he's going to die if you cast yourself down. Well, God will carry, carry you. No, you, that'd be tempting God. He didn't fall for that. And then he goes to Nazareth and he declares that he's beginning his ministry, the Jubilee. And what do they do? They take him to the brow of the hill. They want to push him off and kill him. <laughs> They're trying to kill him continually. They were out for him. In fact, there's one point where he wouldn't walk in, in, Ju in Judea anymore. He only walked Galilee because the Jews were continually seeking to kill him. Now, what was going on? That was Satan working and all of them trying to kill him. He was working any which way trying to kill Jesus in some way. By the way, why was he trying to kill him? You have to understand the big picture. Luke chapter 20 Verse 9, if you remember. A certain man planted a vineyard, this parable, and led it forth to husband. The vineyard is God planting the earth, and he led it out to who? The husbandman, and that was man. And he went into a far country for a long time. Well, what happened? Satan got in control as the husbandman because man sinned, and Satan now got in control. Satan and all the evil spirits. So now they're going to work in all the spiritually dead men, the devil is, to be against anything that God wants to bring forth. So he comes here and he sends this one who's going to check him out, the servant of the husbandman. The husband beat him and sent him away empty. He sends another servant. They beat him and, and sent him away empty. He sent a third, wounded him and cast him out. What did they do to all the ones that were spokesmen? They kept on persecuting, killing them, persecuting all those ones, right? This is all a type of what the devil did through men who were yielded to him. The Lord of the vineyard say, what shall I do? I'll send my beloved son. It shall be they will reverence him when they see him. Well, was the, de the, the devil's going to be reverencing Jesus? No way. 
When the husband saw him, they reasoned among themselves, This is the heir. They thought Jesus was the heir. Come and let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. What inheritance? The inheritance of the earth. Remember that Jeremiah, back in Jeremiah 32, had said, You're to buy this field that's in the country, the earth of Benjamin, the son of the right hand, if you remember that, meaning he's talking about who's going to own the earth. And he told him that the right of redemption and the right of possession of the inheritance was his. And so he bought it for the 17 shekels, remember, and it got put in the, in the, the, in the a vessel for, uh, for many, many days being held on until the one would come who could open it up. And that's what Jesus is going to be doing. But look at this. They wanted to kill him because they thought the inheritance would be theirs. See, the devil thought that if he could kill Jesus, the inheritance of the earth was his. That's what he was trying to do consistently. So how's he going to get to him? He tried every which way and it wasn't working. So how would you try to do? Well, I got to get to him for somebody that's close to him. Remember, he's not walking in Judea anymore. How, we got to get to this guy. So how's he going to get to him? We're going to get to somebody who's walking close to him, his inner circle. Aha. Here's one. He's a stealer of the money. Aha. We can get to him because this guy is walking in the ways of sin. So because he was doing that, what do we see? John chapter 13, <clears throat> we come to after that. The supper be an end of the devil now, having put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. You see, he had a bad attitude. He was mad about the fact that he was put this money, this costly ointment. I took away money I could steal. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to steal as much. Well, so the devil put it into his heart. So now he's found a vessel that he can operate in. And then we get to the place here in Luke 22 where not only is it put into his heart, now he gave, of course, he gave place to it, and now Satan enters into him. The devil entered into him. And what's the devil coming to do? He's coming to kill him. And so now he got to someone who's on the inner circle, being one of the number of the 12. Went his way, and of course, that he might betray him. So the devil was driving him, just like the devil was speaking through Peter. The devil's now operating through Judas, and he is going this way. Now, was God making him do this, as some people have thought? I'll tell you why they think that, these kind of things. There's a prophecy, but you have to understand what this prophecy is saying. The prophecy in Psalms 41, verse 9, said, Yea, mine own familiar friend, Really, what it literally says here, in whom I trusted, if you look this up, it sees, says, really, here it is. But yea, a man, talking about a man, not a specific one, just a man of peace, a man of my peace, it's talking about. So that would be someone who has some kind of a relation to him in some way, like a disciple. And he says, a man of peace who I have trusted. And that's, so that's talking about, he doesn't say anybody specific, but somebody I've trusted. That would talk about somebody in an inner circle, which did eat of my bread, he's going to lift up his heel against me. It was a per, he had the word of wisdom of what was going to happen. It didn't say who it was, but it says somebody's going to do that. So, of course, who was the vessel he found? He found Judas. Judas was the one. And so... What to happen with Judas here? We see that in Matthew chapter, or in Acts chapter 1, verse 25. Look what it says about Judas here. When they were placing him in his apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell. Judas sinned, causing him to fall. He was a sinner by stealing, and then he, Satan got to him more and got him to the place where he would get ahead and go ahead and betray him. You do have to realize that Judas realized this, and he actually confessed his sin, that it was sin and repented before he killed himself. 
It's in Matthew chapter 27. Look in verse 3. Judas, who had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself. He repented. He changed here. That meant he brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, realized he'd done wrong. And then he confessed, saying, I have sinned. I did sin in that I betrayed the innocent blood. <laughs> so what does that tell you? God didn't make him to do that. He knew by word of wisdom that somebody in that inner circle was who Satan was going to get to, and he did get to him. And why was he able to get to him? Aha, here's one who's stealing. Ah, this open door for the devil to get to him. And he started working at him and put in his heart to betray him. And then he, that point where he got mad about the fact and upset about the, all this money being spent. That was just further. Now the devil finally got to him and Satan entered into him. And what did he do? He drove him, of course, to do that. And yet, so did God make him sin? No. Did God understand that somebody was going to be used of the devil for the inner circle that he was going to get to? Yes. And who was the one? Judas was the one. And he got to him. And of course, he's the one who betrayed him. And so we see the fact that, of course, what happened after that? He cast down the piece of silver in the temple, departed, went out and hung himself. The point being is that this is a guy who was preaching the gospel and casting out the demons and he was with Jesus and he saw all the things that he heard. And yet by his transgression he fell. By committing some sin that gave place to the devil, he continued to work. The devil worked at him, put in his heart to betray him, finally got to the place where the devil came into him and then drove him to do it. The point being is that the devil's tactic will be even if you're going forth, he'd like to get you off track some way so he can start to work to take you down. And that's exactly what he did with Judas. Don't let any place to the devil, any sin areas, you, you deal with it because the devil will work that area to get work at you and to start taking you down in the wrong path. That's exactly what he did with him. You got to make sure that you are guarding yourself at all times. And that is mandatory. So much important. So the tactics of the enemy is always to get you off the word, get you into sin, get you in the flesh, get you to look at the back of the world, the guy who wanted to run back to the ways of the world, get you to do something contrary to the world, get you or to the word, get you to compromise some way, get you to have priorities out of line, as we saw, get you to uh, make excuses why, for whatever it might be, any kind of reason it might be. Doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a person or a situation or so something that you would make you, why you can't do the Word of God. These are all the tactics of the enemy. It all that comes down to always getting your eyes off of Jesus and getting your eyes off the Word. Don't let it happen in your life. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you. I understand the tactics of the enemy that will try to come against me, that will try to turn me away from the Word of God and from doing what God says. I thank you that I'm not going to fall for any of his tricks or his strategies or his tactics to get me off the Word. I will not allow anything to get me off and give excuses or have my priorities out in line or be looking at someone else, be a man pleaser, or any of these things that we've seen. I will not allow myself to give place to the enemy's tactics. I will realize what he's trying to do. I will resist his attacks. I will always choose to do what's right in the Word. And I will also study and become studious so that I will not be deceived by any false doctrines. I will always walk in the truth and I will not allow the enemy's tactics to take me down in the wrong direction. I thank you, Lord, as I'm hearing the Word and I'm studying the Word, I'm doing the Word, 
I'm getting revelation. I'm always teachable and correctable. And I'm making sure I know the word exactly. And I have no compromise, no excuses. I'm not going anything contrary to the word. Then I will not give place to any of his tactics. I thank you for revealing all the tactics of the enemy so that I will not be ignorant of how he works. Thank you for delivering me from all the evil. I will walk in your ways. I will pass the test. I will be in the marriage. I will be a true disciple. And I will follow the Lord always in line with the Word of God all the days of my life. Thank you for giving me revelation and always leading me and guiding me in the right path as I put the word of first, first place in my life. Thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for helping everyone to, again, see more of the tactics of the enemy so we realize how he might try to work in our life to take us down a wrong path. And he'll even be willing to take a little bit and then keep on get stronger and stronger. We, we're not going to get placed for even a second. As Paul said, he's not going to give him for a moment to get, to, to get off of the Word of God. Thank you, Father. We're going to be doing what you say, and we will not be taken off course ever. We will walk that straight and narrow path. We will do all that you command. We will see your tremendous work accomplished in our life. Thank you. We will overcome all tactics of the enemy in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God.